Yeah, so hello everybody. Uh, this is uh, yet another public meeting of Cycloge where we are looking into tools and libraries uh, which are part of the emerging stack of uh, data science and data exploration in Clojure. And um, amazing things have been happening recently, really beautiful developments. And one of them is this new library that Anthony Kong uh, will be uh, sharing uh, with us today. Um, uh, Anthony Kong, uh, uh, we have met uh, Anthony in previous meetings and, and you uh, maybe you have seen uh, Anthony's uh, presentation about uh, Guinea, the library for uh, Spark processing in Clojure. And uh, I think I, I'm so excited to see a new thing by Atom Anthony because I'm still learning the previous one, which is uh, really, really an amazing piece of sort of software. Um, and uh, Anthony is a mathemat mathematician and statistician and a machine learning practitioner and also a software development. And also he is leading uh, a company uh, who is do doing, uh, among other things, uh, software and uh, analysis uh, services in Clojure. And uh, Anthony, if it is okay, then it would be great to present yourself too, because you will do it more accurately than what I did. Um, and yeah, uh, let us begin. So uh, hello, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Daniel. Let me start by sharing my screen, if I may. Okay. Um... Please let me know if you can see the, the, the screen. Yes. Is it up? Okay, yes. great. So, um, yeah, uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for joining us today. Um, and I suppose like uh, first thing is, is to say thank you as well to, to Daniel and, and, and the Cyclosh community in general. Uh, there's, there's been a lot happening uh, in the Clojure data ecosystem and I'm really, uh, you know, uh, excited to be part of that. And uh, yeah, I think Daniel is being, uh, you know, is doing such a wonderful job and sort of rallying everyone uh, and sort of uh, getting people, other people excited as well. So thank you, uh, Daniel. Um, so yeah, uh, today I want to talk about spreadsheets. Uh, and uh, I mean, the, the, the title is, is, is about the, uh, the, the library uh, that we develop, but really what I wanna focus today is not so much about the implementation, but really the, the general idea of, of the library. Right? Uh, in particular, like uh, this uh, certain approach to building spreadsheets. Um, the library itself is, is still very much a work in progress, uh, but I hope by sort of presenting the ideas early, uh, we, we can get some feedback and, you know, that sort of influences the direction of the library. Uh, and to quickly cover the context of why we even developed this, right? Like we work a lot with enterprise clients and uh, many times like part of the deliverables are like automated Excel uh, reports. And it's, it's just natural for us to sort of like uh, to have our own sort of uh, vocabulary and grammar to, to, to talk about uh, automating um, sort of Excel reports. Uh, so uh, we've, we've got Fixel here uh, today. And yeah, it's, it's pronounced Fixel, by the way, uh, for no other reason than, than you know, slightly poking fun at the English language, because why not? There isn't any rules for this, right? Uh, the idea is like F, F is functional, XL is Excel, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, there's, there's nothing uh, more to it uh, than that. Um, so the plan of attack for today is that, as I said, I want to focus more on the idea, right? Um, rather than the implementation. So the first section I'll devote, uh, I'll devote it to sort of going over the high level view uh, of, uh, you know, of the thinking and sort of like the, the, the desi design decisions that, are, uh, that go into it, right? And I'm gonna make some hypothesis there. And hopefully uh, in the second section, I'll be able to show it to you that, you know, this is, this is a, a nice way to compose uh, sort of spreadsheet operations. And uh, the third section, the final section, it's called discussions, but really it's sort of like, you know, random thoughts put together and hopefully it'll, it'll get, you know, people talking, right? Uh, yeah. 
So, uh, oh, and also, uh, you know, if I, I, if I don't make any sense, uh, please feel free to stop me uh, anytime, really. Uh, and yeah, we can discuss it then and there. Um, so on to the very first section, the motivation and design goals, right? So if you Google uh, Clojure Excel, right, you'll find these two libraries, Jobjure and Excel CLJ. Uh, and really, uh, I would very much say that they're more mature uh, and they're very well maintained as well, uh, more so than fixed scope, right? Uh, so why bother, right? Like if there are already existing ways to, to do this, right? And, you know, one of my biggest complaints about the Clojure ecosystem in general, as someone who's relatively new to Clojure, right, is that the community never rallies behind like a single library. Like the, there's always this library fragmentation. And so for me, at least, this is, uh, you know, it's very important for me to be able to justify this. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and the way I would do that is by uh, invoking this idea of like structured spreadsheets, right? Um, the idea of structured spreadsheets, so existing libraries are good for structured spreadsheets. And what I mean by that is that when you're sort of dealing with tabular data uh, and uh, you know, uh, you're dealing with very structured kind of computations. So for instance, so this is a tabular data, right? And maybe uh, in the spreadsheet, the bottom row is always the sum or like the, the, the rightmost column is always some sort of an aggregation, uh, whatever that can be, but that's very structured, very rigid uh, that way. And it makes sense in these cases to represent spreadsheets as, uh, you know, here a vector of vectors of values. So, or a matrix of values, right? Um, or in Excel CLJ, uh, they have a vector of records, right? So key, fixed key value pairs. Um, and basically these are like good ideas taken from data frame like representations, right? So these are like proven. So that there isn't anything wrong with that. And then that works, right? But what about unstructured spreadsheets, right? And what do I mean by that? And what I mean by unstructured spreadsheets is, you know, uh, it looks like they've been designed by humans, right? Uh, and I mean, they're like ad hoc based bits and pieces. There are many exceptions, things that don't line up really, and a lot of little chunks. Um, and the question is that like, can you imagine sort of like, uh, you know, what's the, the matrix representation of this particular spreadsheet, right? Like you have a lot of nils and it's probably quite finicky to sort of like put things in the right way. And what about style, right? Like how do you, how do you put things uh, in a nicer way? Like uh, I would imagine that it's, it's, it's quite difficult uh, to do that. And you know, these kind of spreadsheets are ubiquitous, right? Like there's, there's nothing wrong with this. It's, it's actually optimized for human re readability. Like if I give you like one of these uh, spreadsheets, like you know exactly what to put in there. That's it's, it's actually immediately obvious. So uh, to me, this difference between structured and unstructured spreadsheets are really like the difference between like PRN and PrintLN, right? They have different consumers, once for machine readability and once for human readability. And I want to sort of like dig down a little bit more on why it's kind of hard to sort of um, uh, build these kind of spreadsheets with the matrix representation or with the record representation. And to do that, I want to invoke Rich Hickey, as you do, right, in a, in a closure talk. And in his talk, uh, Simplicity Matters in 2012, I think, at a Ruby conference, he said something that really resonates to me but unfortunately it doesn't really get quite as much attention than I think it deserves. And he said that like, if order matters, complexity has been introduced to the system. And really like he's, he's talking about uh, in the context of Ruby, right? Like you, you can have a return value just like in Python, like of multiple return values. But instead of doing that, why don't you name it in an associative map, right? And here, like I've got an example of like two floats and two ints, like, you can have a function that return that, or you can actually return this map instead. And this sort of like brings you a different kind of clarity, right? Like this, this has a 
more of a meaning than this. Um, and when we take this analogy to spreadsheets, and I'm talking about this translation, right? This matrix of values is supposed to represent a spreadsheet. But with matrices, like we leave the exact locations of where the value should be implicit in the matrix. It's like we're complexing the values and the locations. And I think this can be fixed with an unordered collection of maps, sort of like putting it this way instead. And you would think that this is more verbose and a lower level representation of the spreadsheet. But I think it's important to take a step back in abstraction. And I, hopefully I can show you later that we can take two steps forwards. And my hypothesis really is that what makes tabular formats hard in unstructured spreadsheet cases is that you're mixing up the locations and the values. And we need to decouple that. We need to decouple the values, locations, and for that matter, style as well. And the main idea of uh, Fixel is that um, hopefully it's, you know, once, once uh, jumping from that point, like it's, it's quite easy where, where to see like where we're going with this, right? This thing can be represented as an unordered collection of, of cells where cell is just a map. Um, and, and these are just like naked literals, right? These are like closure data structures. Um, and hopefully by doing this, um, we can achieve a number of things. The first thing is this orthogonality, right? This sort of like somewhat, uh, some sort of independence when you can sort of like look at the value, location and style orthogonal. Uh, hopefully I can, I can show that in the, the second section. And secondly, you can have like a Lego-like component development. And what I mean is that you have this unstructured spreadsheet, you can sort of like think about it in, in little chunks and these little chunks will be manageable and then you can sort of like compose everything together in the end. And finally, uh, something that I, you know, I, I, I derive some enjoyment of, uh, over is that like you can, this representation of a spreadsheet, you can re literally put in a, in a .clj file, right? Like these are just closure data structures. And there's, there's something uh, that feels right about this WYSIWYG property. Um, so, so those are the design goals. And what, what's not a design goal is, is, is I must say, performance, right? Um, the other libraries are more performant uh, and you know, they're just more mature for structured cases. And I would say that it is, um, little reason to use Fixel there if uh, you can get away with Docker or Excel CLG, right? Um, so if it's small, uh, you, can, you can use Docker or Excel CLG. If it's big, you can consider going to Apache POI uh, directly, which is, you know, all of these libraries are built on top of the Java um, library, Apache POI. But I hope sort of like when you, get into these unstructured cases, you, you do give uh, Fixel uh, a go. Uh, yeah. And, you know, uh, for big unstructured cases, I, you know, I would sort of stop that, you know, uh, maybe this is not the right thing to do, right? Uh, because again, like unstructured spreadsheets for me are meant to be consumed by humans, right? Like what does it mean to have like, you know, uh, big amounts of data uh, in, in, in one, spreadsheet like that, unless it's, it's going to be machine readable. So I would rethink the approach uh, if you, hopefully you don't fall into, into the, uh, this, uh, you know, the fourth quarter here. So that, that's sort of like the high level um, thinking, right, uh, about uh, Fixel, this uh, data oriented and composable uh, library, right, for spreadsheet. And I sort of, so that's the hypothesis and hopefully I can, I can show it to you um, in, in, the, in the second section. Um, there's gonna be a lot of code, but uh, the code itself doesn't, uh, it's, it's nothing special. Uh, like uh, I hope it doesn't really distract you from, from the, the really important thing, right? Which is the mindset and sort of like the, the approach to build a, a particular spreadsheet. And the example that I wanna use is, is something like this. 
and and this is based on on real life yeah like this is a, a very simplified version of uh, something that we need to do for one of our clients um, the context is that you're a manufacturing company and you want to keep track of your raw material uh, inventory in check right uh, you, you have some 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 idea of how much you're using. You you know you you have some idea of how much you're buying, and you know how much you have in stock right now. And you want to sort of flag out like certain cases where uh, maybe uh, there's a risk of running out of stock. And uh, we're making an Excel report to be printed and signed by hand, right? Uh, and we're going to give it to our the head of supply chain. So this is meant to be printed. Um, definitely human for human consumption, right? And there are three main components here. Uh, the very first component is this sort of like form header. Um, and this is some sort of like an ISO requirement. Uh, you need to have like, uh, you know, the form ID, like uh, the revision number and, and where, where it's made and all of that. And then there are the actual projections uh, where on the, on, the, on the leftmost column, you've got the, the raw material names, and then uh, you've got the, the time, uh, January, February, March, and you've got like the different types of quantities, like opening, inflows, outflows, opening, inflows, outflows, and so on and so forth. So there'll be four quarters in a year, uh, but then I've already sort of uh, shown you the, the very first one, but then we're gonna make the full four. And then at the very bottom, there's gonna be these like boxes uh, for people to say, okay, yeah, I've, I've, sort of uh, this created by me and this is approved by some of the people for people to sign, right? So we're gonna make these empty boxes as well. And also some, some styling as well. Um, so if, it's, if the stock is running dangerously low, we're gonna sort of highlight it. And if it's negative, we're gonna highlight it in red. And so th th this is sort of like a, a representation of like what, you know, the kinds of spreadsheets that, that we would make with the Fixel. And this is sort of like the, the more high level overview of, of, of what uh, we're making. Um, okay. So at a very high level, um, the, 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 the ladder of abstraction here is that we're sort of going to first do the cell building. So we're gonna make the individual cells so this part is not really fun, right? Like it, someone has to do it. <laughs> we're gonna make these uh, load cells and then we're gonna compose and then uh, we're gonna make it so that they sort of stick together in a nicer way. Uh, and this is, um, for instance, there's this helper function called concat right, which just means these bunch of cells put it to the right of the other bunch of cells, right? And then you've got all the other things like concat below, pad below, uh, you know, it'll, it'll be immediately obvious what this is when we encounter an example. Um, then the, as a final step, that's literally just one uh, function call, which is you can write to Excel once you have all the cells sort of merged together into one collection. So by, by and large, this is how, how we're going to do things. And just to show you what kind of control we can get with Fixel, um, this is the default uh, cell, right? So if you call like two cell to, to an empty map, you get like a nil value. And then the coordinate is like you put in the top left of sheet one, sheet one being the default sheet in, in, in Excel. And then style, there's a bunch of stuff there, but really like uh, for most of the time, you, you wouldn't care about, about these things. And you just leave it as, as, as the as the default, right? Uh, maybe you'll sort of like come in and then, okay, I want that ball. Okay, so that you just sort of like tweak them. We'll get into them. So uh, we're gonna start our build. The, you know, uh, starting the build, the, the, the zeroth step here is like, okay, get the data. And I'm imagining like we're, we're getting the data from some sort of an API call, you know, uh, or, or you know, uh, some, some read from a database, right? Uh, we're we're gonna grab the data and it doesn't really matter like how the data is laid out. Uh, I'm, I'm laying it out like this, um, but yeah. Uh, so data is, is there, now we just need to put it uh, in this sort of like spreadsheet canvas. 
Um, the very first thing uh, we're going to work on, uh, and again, we're going to work in like little bits of components, is sort of like the top bit, right? And here we've got like a helper function called table to cells, which takes in a matrix of values. Uh, and uh, it's going to sort of give you like this collection of cells when you write it to Excel, when you write it uh, uh, to a file, like it's going to look like this. And, and that's, that's just going to be like a four by two uh, cells, right? So, uh, and again, like this looks kind of bad, right? Like it really doesn't look presentable, but that's okay. We're gonna work on that later. But first thing is, is, is the value. So that's the first component done. So that's, that's not so painful. The second component is sort of this uh, created by and approved by boxes. And the way we're going to do that is to use the same kind of trick, uh, table to cells, but then we're going to combine these two uh, collections of cells together. So concat right is going to put like uh, the red part next to the green part, but then we want to have like this two column gutter uh, here. So we say, okay, pad right by two. Uh, you can do this pad right by two uh, and uh, they'll just uh, put that there. And this is sort of how you compose like uh, different collections of cells together. Cool. So that's the second component done. And the third component is like this big chunk, right? And we're going to break it down again into subcomponents. The first subcomponent is the header. Uh, the header we have like Q1 and then empty and then the, the, the month name and so on and so forth. And again, we're just going to represent that as a vector. And then we're gonna have this uh, uh, helper function called row to cells. That's just gonna lay it out in one row, right? And then on, uh, that goes, that's gonna sit on top of this header of raw material opening inflows, outflows, opening inflows, outflows. And again, this is just sort of like composing uh, uh, collections of cells together. So we've got that. Uh, the next thing is the left uh, hand uh, column that's just going to show you like what raw materials uh, they are. And we're going to use tables of cells where uh, it's going to be a matrix, but it's going to be a vector of vectors of length one. Uh, so that's just how that looks like. Uh, I'm, I, you know, I just uh, grabbed this from some random website, by the way. This is, uh, doesn't really mean much. Um, and then uh, the final subcomponent to this is the inventory itself. So the inventory is also just another table. So we can sort of like uh, pull that out uh, from our sort of uh, data, right? And that's, uh, there's, there's nothing special here. It's just sort of from the raw materials, you're gonna grab three things and then you're gonna map through it, right? So, uh, uh, then uh, that it's gonna look like that. So the magic happens when you sort of like put these things together. Like uh, you've got contact below, uh, you've got the table header at the top, you already have this somewhere at the top of the source code, right? And then what sits below that is this, concat the, this right concatenation of the column cells and then the first month, second month and third month. And that's, that's your table done for the entire quarter. So you just sort of like binding stuff together. And then uh, once you have that sort of like abstracted into a, a function, you can sort of repeat that for uh, every quarter. And again, th this is just uh, concat below and pad below because we want to have like one, one row where it's just empty and you just sort of like bind things together. And now you have this like full year of data and the rest is just sort of like putting it into like one spreadsheet. Okay, there's the form header, there's the inventory uh, bodies, and then there's the footer uh, using the same kind of functions. Uh, but that's, so, so, so that's the data and the layout uh, done, right? But it still looks kind of ugly and the beauty of this is that you can sort of think about the styles a bit later. 
And you, you can have this um, sort of like utility functions of, so where you sort of come in and just modify a particular style of the cell. Uh, it doesn't really matter, like, you know, bold, a line, gray background, whatever. And you can even have something a little bit more complex, sort of like, okay, look up the value, uh, see if the quantity is, is it of a certain range, and then I want to, I want to highlight it appropriately. Uh, but all of these stuff is just closure functions. Uh, these are just operations on maps, right? These are just associates for the most part. And the idea is that you just sort of style it in the right way. So uh, I'm gonna style the inventory. Uh, so I need this uh, to just to map style inventory. I want everything to have like automatic col column size. So that's automatic column size right there. Uh, and this thing is, is, is just as before, right? Like it just sort of like puts the styles in, in, in different places. Um, sorry, uh, so really like what we've done here is um, sort of thinking about the value, the locations or the layouts and the styles independently, right? Like we first thought about the value and then we put them together into like uh, the spreadsheet layout uh, that we want and then we think about styles uh, later. And yeah, uh, in essence, sort of like uh, we're dealing with the three different key value pairs sort of separately. So that at any given time, we're working with like a manageable chunk. Uh, and it's only, you know, we can sort of like compose the simple chunks together, simple operations together into something that's, that's quite complex. And anyway, this is just a simple uh, example of that. And uh, on to the sort of like uh, the, you know, the random thoughts, right? Uh, the discussions. Um, yeah, like what did we just do really, right? Like um, the way we built spreadsheet in the second section was by incrementally making these cells and sort of putting them together. Um, and all of the cells are represented as uh, just naked closure data structures, like closure literals. Literally, you can put that and which is in, and just like a but like that collection, put that in a in a .clg file, and that that's your spreadsheet right there, right there. And Apache POI actually comes in very very late, and this is sort of like the Apache POI is like a very imperative. It's a Java library, right? So you sort of like set cells and uh, you know put stuff there, set background and all of these stuff. That, but that comes in very, very late. Uh, so what we've done really is that we've pushed this sort of imperative parts of the application to the, to the very end. Uh, so we only deal with, for the most part, uh, we deal with uh, closure data structures and at the very last minute, we just do write XLXX. And, and, and that's that, and that's sort of like the, this Gary Bernhardt's maxim of, you know, uh, functional core and imperative share. Right? So th th that's that's one thing that's that's quite nice about this sort of uh, setup. And the other thing is that if you uh, all, like a lot of our helper functions are actually uh, a function that's uh, take that that takes a cell as an argument and then returns another cell, or uh, takes in a collection of cell and returns a collection of cell. In a sense, like they, they form this monoid, right? So you can sort of like arbitrarily compose them together. And for me, this is this is the Lego-like uh, quality that you're you're looking for uh, when when you have this arbitrary composition, when the input of one thing can be the output of the other one, and that can be the input to another operation. So we're just playing around with monoids, really. Um, and finally, um, you know, sort of like circling back to uh, this idea of simplicity uh, for spreadsheets, right? For me, there are like really three important factors here. Um, that's data orientedness, immutability, and unorderedness. And without data orientedness, if you sort of like hide stuff, right, into like its own classes, its own objects, it's... Uh, 
Sorry? Oh, I think that's a random noise. Okay, so if you don't have data orientedness, uh, you don't get this nice closure uh, facilities of like associate and get in all of these stuff, right? And if you don't have immutability, you sort of have to think about the value of, of, of the spreadsheet over time. And that's not nice. And if you don't have unorderedness, you're basically complexing these values and the locations together. And that, that ends up being useful for certain cases, but not for other cases. Uh, so yeah, so for me, the, these are the three ingredients for simplicity. And um, finally, like uh, just, just a thought, right? Like fix those operations are not like completely order free, right? Like we haven't talked about like cells that are in the same coordinates and then they would override one another. We haven't talked about merged cells and they'll sort of like sit on top of another cell. So there, there are complications. So, um, and, and obviously the, the order of how you compose these uh, operations uh, matters as well. Obviously like you can change the border and then you can change the font color and then you can switch that around. That order of composition is fine but then some compositions matter. Uh, so when you're looking at the value and then you're later on changing the value. Uh, yeah, so it's not everything is order free, right? But a lot of it are. And so just like a final thought on spreadsheets, right? Like we've really been talking about like writing or building a spreadsheet, but we haven't really um, spoken a lot about like parsing a spreadsheet. Um, you, you can load a spreadsheet to Fixel, uh, on Fixel, right? And then you'll just get a collection of cells again. Uh, but then I would imagine it'd be pretty hard to break it down into components. If you think about sort of the example that we just looked at, like we thought about it as components and then we uh, put them together, uh, together in the end. But then once you've got a blob and then you sort of, you want to parse it back into different uh, and different components, unless you have a template, that, that's gonna be very difficult. So uh, that, that's, that's a harder problem than building spreadsheets, I feel. But maybe it's okay because, uh, maybe it's okay that we don't have like a good solution for that because at the end of the day, like uh, these uh, spreadsheets are consumed predominantly by humans, right? Like uh, it doesn't have to be as machine readable. And if you want it to be machine readable, you maybe opt for these more structured kind of spreadsheets. So uh, maybe there's a symmetry of needs here. Um, anyway, uh, that's, that's uh, the end of uh, a brief talk. Uh, yeah, and thank you for listening. As I said, like Fixel is still very much uh, a work in progress and any kinds of contributions uh, are very welcome. And uh, Zach recently uh, contributed a, a fair amount and, and, and that was awesome. He really uh, implemented uh, some, some uh, really useful features for us. So yeah, uh, contributions are welcome. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you for listening. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Great. So, um, yeah, I feel that I want to ask a lot now and, and uh, I imagine that there will be questions now. Uh, should we maybe have a small discussion and then a break and then some more discussion? Does it sound good? Sure, sure. Yeah, sure. wonderful. Uh, um, does anybody want to ask anything? I have a question if nobody else got one. Sure. Um, so what about error messages on this? Mm. So everything is spec. Um, everything is like strictly spec. So before you, you write, uh, when you do write XLXX, uh, it, uh, it'll sort of check whether or not it, it complies to the, to the cell spec. And then if it doesn't, it'll point to you exactly where, where things uh, are, are missing or are wrong. Nice, thank you. Sure. Can you show an example if you get a chance? Maybe not now. Uh, yeah. Uh, Maybe after the break, if you... Sure, have... sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Just what happens. Yeah. So, uh, 
yeah, it'll be uh, spec error uh, errors, right? Like validation errors, which are yeah, sometimes yeah, just make not, them... not very great to look at. But yeah, I can I can show it absolutely. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Mm. This is really fantastic work, Anthony. So thank, thank you, you thank for, you so much. Thank you for this. Uh, now, when you talk about spreadsheets, yeah. Um, we need to also talk about CSV files and uh, other spreadsheets like Google spreadsheets and uh, yeah. Google Sheets yeah. and uh, numbers from Apple. Uh, how, do, how does this stand with those formats? So this was developed with Excel in mind, but Zach <laughs> implemented the Google Sheets uh, part. Uh, so you can just write sheets, read sheets. Uh, in theory, it should really be free of Excel, right? But then the defaults are, are Excel. So yeah, I, I don't see any reason. I was, I was looking at, uh, so Google Sheets are, are definitely possible. Uh, you, you need to put your, your Google uh, credentials somewhere for it to read, but, but I've used it before, so it's quite nice. Uh, um, I haven't looked into numbers or uh, office calc. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's even possible for numbers because uh, yeah, it, I, I, yeah, I don't know if that is possible, basically. Mm. So with Google Sheets, obviously you can give an, a URI or URL for that, right? With, um, with the Excel also, is, it, is that uh, something you can do? A to URL. point it to a URL where an Excel spreadsheet, say for example, if it's on a SharePoint mm. site or something? Oh, no, I, I haven't looked into that, uh, I'm, okay. I'm afraid. Uh, so for Excel, it's just paths for, um, Google Sheets, uh, Zach, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a spreadsheet ID, right? Uh, and and, and that, that's just that. And then uh, Google will check your credentials and see if you have write access or read access. And then you can, mm -hmm. it's a safe yeah. representation though. Okay, thanks. Mm. Sure. Uh, but I think uh, when talking about Pixel, it it's more like it produces a XLSX file, as in that's that's where the defaults are. Uh, what Apache POI produces, so that can be read on Libra Office Corp as like okay. the same as like Excel. Yeah. I see, I see. But but, but then there's the ODT uh, file format as well, which is different to XLSX, right? Yeah, it's different. I'm, what, I'm wondering if sort of like you can do instead of write XLXX, you can write ODT, but then you still have the same collection of cells and that, that thing should be abstracted away from you. Like you shouldn't have to care. So I think that that's something uh, like a worthwhile feature to have, which is currently not implemented, of course. Anthony, I have a question about sure. the relationship between Genie and yeah. Effexel. Uh, so, so my journey with Effexel started because I was using Genie quite productively. It's a beautiful okay. program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I looked at the options, and it didn't seem quite uh, the inter interface of Docker and Excel Clojure weren't quite as what I was looking for. So I kept on looking because Effexel didn't show up at first. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at Effexel, and I realized immediately that it really played very well with Genie. Was that an accident or was it something planned or uh, is an ecosystem that you're trying to build? No, uh, I think it's an accident. Like, what do you mean by it? It plays quite nicely with, with Genie. Oh, uh, maybe if it is okay, let us uh, remind the, audi the audience what Genie is. If oh, it is yes. okay. Yeah, sure. So Guinea is, is another uh, library uh, developed by Zero and Group uh, to do uh, data frames. So, so it's meant to be closure data frames. It runs on Spark. Uh, at, at first, I called it a, a wrapper, a Spark wrapper, but then I didn't want to sort of get tied into sort of like committing into uh, just the Spark API. Uh, so it's, 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 it's a data frame library, basically. And, and obviously, there's sort of like an overlap between um, sort of playing around with data and maybe wanting to represent that into spreadsheets. So this is sort of where the intersection between Guinea and Fixel comes in. 
uh, yeah, so that's that's the context, I suppose. Uh, but but yeah, uh, Andres, like, uh, what do you mean by it? It, 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 it work, works nicely together. Well, so if if I'm doing something with a data frame, and then I collect my data frame, right. I get a really nice map, and then in Flexel I can use the map to rows function, and voila, I have yeah. my spreadsheet it's in it's in, it's really a nice way to produce output from Jenny really nice really easy okay that, that's that's uh, wonderful to know uh, the, the two projects are, are unrelated uh, actually like it's just uh, it's born out of like different works for different clients uh, we the 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 intersection is uh, where, where I sort of used it is when I'm working on something with Guinea, right? And then I need to send something, some sort of data in CSV format. And then, so I write to Google Sheets like that. But that was, that was the extent to uh, the sort of how I used it together. But it's, it's, it's great to, to hear that, uh, that, that it's actually uh, working well together. Hmm. Great. Mm. Yeah, so I guess uh, in a moment uh, will be maybe a good timing for break. And let us maybe think what we want to ask Anthony after the break. I think to me, uh, this talk was really like enlightening in a way that, that it brings us thoughts about what could be done, right? And uh, maybe we, it is like a common feeling for us that sometimes when a closure a wrapper is built, there is this sense of liberation, right? Because things which were actually very difficult to do are becoming maybe easier. And maybe that is something a bit special about closure that it is not afraid of nested data structures, right? That actually it can be a joy to work with nested data, which is not obvious in other language platforms. So here it does open possibilities uh, for specific use cases. So it will be nice to imagine some use cases and maybe discuss them after the break. And uh, what do you think, uh, 10 minutes or five? What would be good? Uh, I, I, I don't mind, I have no preference. Great, so, so let us have five minutes and uh, see you soon and uh, let us continue. Take care. Hello again to the recording. We are back from the back, mm. from the break, and uh, we will now continue our discussion. And um, maybe uh, here's a suggestion, like a general mm. suggestion for how we could go about it. Uh, something that we really like to do after talks and after we have a new library is to have those uh, weekend meetings where we are studying together and practicing and exploring. And if anybody wants to bring up some use case or some technical question, then we can uh, offer it now and maybe bring it to one of our uh, joint sessions on one of the days and do it together. So let us think about it. Uh, great. So uh, Anthony, you were about to show your screen and show something, right? Yeah. So I think Elena um, asked about uh, if, if, if uh, the, uh, like what, what the error message is like. So here we're just sort of um, a, a writing uh, a, a, like just one cell, but uh, Andres pointed out that if you, if you don't have a value, it'll complain. So uh, here uh, we don't have a value, right? Uh, and then uh, when we try to write it, it says, okay, spec failed should contain key value. And yeah, that's, uh, and then it, it also tells you, right, it, it can be a nail or it can be something. But uh, yeah, that, that's the kind of error message you get, I suppose. Hmm. That, that's to answer the, the question uh, that was uh, asked previously. Cool. Yeah, thank you. I'm looking at the formatting of this. This is nice. Yeah, and uh, may maybe I'll ask something. Um, mm, sure. So, um, uh, some uh, ex 
experience that I've had uh, with myself and people around me is that sometimes we use spreadsheets to solve some life problems, like okay. accounting or something yes. like that. And yes. then sometimes there is this happiness that actually we have a tool that is useful and can help us. And I think this, this happiness about spreadsheets is something that many people have, not only uh, software mm -hmm. people, not only programmers. But then sometimes it is actually difficult. And, and we find ourselves doing a lot of manual work with spreadsheets, like doing some repetition with all the cells because we know what we need to do, but we don't have a way to program it, or maybe we mm -hmm. don't know how. And so Fixel or something like that could possibly open a, mm. a door for many people to enjoy the joy of closure, the joy of being able to do something, to automate with mm. nested data. How yeah. are you thinking about it, about somehow bringing it to wider audiences? Yeah, Not an easy so, question, so, I guess. No, no. <laughs> Um, at the moment, like uh, I, I, I don't know if you're if, uh, if you're thinking about sort of like um, taking into account like Excel formulae, right? Uh, or uh, actually doing the logic in closure and then taking Excel as just sort of a, kind of like your front end, right? Like this is how I'm going to present it. Because uh, if you're thinking about it as a front end, I think I think that works. You can definitely use closure to do all of your your logic and then and just put it uh, in, in, in an Excel, and then it looks nicer. It's it's more uh, friendly to uh, it's more readable. Uh, but uh, support for uh, formulae uh, and sort of com uh, creating like complex applications in Excel and doing it through closure. I don't know. Uh, one, it's not it's not implemented, and uh, I don't know if that, that's uh, uh, how how painful uh, that 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 would be. So I, I suppose yeah, that, that part I'm I'm not entirely sure of. I, I don't know if I if I fully answered your your question. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I'm but, just trying to imagine. You know? <laughs> so uh, actually, tools like desktop tools like Excel are one place where we have UI for spreadsheets, mm. but there are also mm. those web spreadsheets where mm. you could somehow interact with them, maybe with some web user interface that could right. gradually right. introduce closure as a way to talk with them like intelligently. Mm. Mm. Possibly, yeah. Mm. I have a question, Anthony. Sure. Um, so you said that formula, formula, formulas are not implemented, but I think Zach has at least the yeah. beginnings of it, yeah. right? Because yeah. I used them already. You can sure. you can you can write a an Excel formula with with Fexel. And yeah. a question that I had was, if you had given any thought of how to how to do the notation. Because right now, what one can do is do a very simple um, Excel range um, yeah. formula, right? Something like yeah. sum a exactly. two yeah. to a twenty, right? Just as you would. But I'm, you know, I've been thinking about, uh, you know, a little bit of, of, about this problem because I think you'd be wonderful, if, wonderful if if there was a notation where you could have maybe the concept of an anchor point and uh, automatically generate uh, the yeah. formulas, right? Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I suppose uh, to, just to clarify, like formulae are, are are supported, but then as as Andres points out, like a lot of the Excel formula, like you need to specify like A5, F, F6 to like G12, right? Like uh, that's, that's a little bit hard. like, it's not impossible to do it programmatically, but then uh, like from a user experience perspective, that's, that's really not nice, right? So uh, for me, like uh, formulae is, 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 is sort of unsolved at the moment, but um, yeah, I, 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 I the way I would think about it is, I, I suppose, sort of uh, uh, how we, uh, how, how you're using it at the moment, Andres. So maybe you're sort of like, uh, you, okay, you need to sum this particular cells. Then we can have a helper function that sort of scans the cell and then uh, think about like, okay, what, what would that map out, 
to uh, to the uh, this uh, a one coordinates right uh, and that, that that could be helpful but then uh, I would think about the use cases first I suppose and then think about sort of like nice uh, nice abstractions uh, to to work with that but yeah uh, I, I don't have an, a good answer for that at the moment I'm afraid. <laughs> I don't know, Zach, Zach, do you have uh, like uh, an idea on this? Yeah, it's really helpful. Um, so maybe Daniel would be appropriate to give some some perspective on the work I've done with, with, with in this area. That would be great. So, so way back in the 2000s, I had to produce output for clients using Excel. And for that, I used uh, the uh, COM protocol for Windows, you could, the idea back then was that you could generate Excel spreadsheets by actually opening up Excel and then interacting directly with Excel's object system. And it proved to be really helpful because uh, um, clients like to be able to get a spreadsheet and then they like to modify it. They want to add more computations. Maybe they want to import numbers that they have access to. So for instance, um, I can produce sales information and a client can have margin information and then they do the merge within Excel and then they can have a spreadsheet that is richer. Um, it, perhaps they're not, they don't feel comfortable sharing the numbers, the, you know, their margin numbers with me that they, are, they can do that themselves. Um, so what I noticed back then was that you really had to think in terms of objects. And it feels to me that Apache POI has extended that thinking. So what I find really exciting about the work that Anthony is doing is that it really pivots away from objects and really moves into data structures. Uh, so, so that you can actually think about the problem and then the Excel implementation is completely orthogonal to the production of data. So I think that's really where the novelty lies. And, you know, I think Anthony doesn't take enough credit, but the same thing happens with Kenny, where a lot of attention has been given to the ergonomics of data processing. So I, I, used, starting, I used Spark starting back in 2014, and, and I was reasonably proficient, but I had always felt difficult to think in a Spark-like fashion. And I feel that the Gany implementation, you can call it a wrapper, but it's a really ergonomic wrapper. So I'm really excited about this way of thinking in terms of data, because the Gany platform allows you to think very abstractly with large data sets. And I think the Fixel approach allows you to then take that data and serve it up for humans. Thank you, Andres. That that really really makes my day. I think that that's uh, thank you for the kind words. Hey, Anthony. Yeah. Um, were you going to talk about parsing spreadsheets? Unstructured, uh, unstructured spreadsheets. Structured spreadsheets is, are easy, right? That's. Yeah. Um, uh, but unstructured spreadsheets can get pretty tricky. And yeah. um, is, is that something you're going to talk about later or? That sounds like a machine learning problem. I, I don't know. <laughs> well, not, well, un, it's not quite unstructured, right? We're talking about yeah. semi-structured. Okay, or, yeah. In a way, yeah. right? It's not completely unstructured, yeah. right? Because just from the examples that you showed, right? You have a header section and then you have some body and then you have some, uh, a, a, a footer section and in the body itself it can be broken up into different sections within it right so uh, one of the ways to approach this is to provide a templating mechanism where yeah. say if you have uh, you know if you want to process multiple spreadsheets and th this is what usually happens right you have a number of spreadsheets which follow a certain pattern that you want you need to process uh, for whatever purpose uh, and to be able to describe that template, right? Yeah. 
would be very useful, then you can say, hey, uh, you know, process this set of documents using this template and that set of documents using a different template. So is, is that something that seems feasible within the, uh, uh, you know, Fixel <laughs> space? Yeah, so, uh, so so just a bit of background, right? Like uh, Fixel is, was originally implemented at Python. Uh, mm -hmm. And, but then we, we, we haven't really open sourced that, that part because it's not as well thought out, I thought. But the, 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 the similar ideas are there, sort of like providing everything in dictionaries and then writing it with OpenPy Excel uh, later on. Mm -hmm. um, what we do for our client is actually something like that. Uh, they, uh, they don't want to input uh, stuff on a web UI, right? Like uh, they, don't, they don't want to input like, so, so we make them solvers, uh, you know, to, to tell them like, uh, like how to do uh, purchase planning. Like, let's, let's just put it that way. But there's a lot, a lot of parameters. Uh, they don't want to sort of like put them one by one on a web UI. Uh, but they already have like spreadsheet reports. Uh, so what we do for them is we, we parse their spreadsheet reports and then we spit out like something, something like that, right? Like something I, I presented uh, previously. But the parsing part for me is, is, I mean, the way we do that is, is really not, not so elegant. It's more like, okay, uh, the, the sort of like a dividing line and that's going to be your top section but then it's it's very hard to it's, it's very easy to make a mistake there so i haven't i haven't come across like uh, uh, um, an elegant way of doing it so that, that's why i haven't really spoken uh, about it but yeah uh, some some sort of templating uh, some sort of like a fixel template and then uh, when you load it and then you can sort of load it to the template but yeah, that, that's still an abstract idea for me. Like uh, I still don't know how to sort of uh, crystallize that, I, I suppose. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely not an easy one. And even for mm. structured templates, structured spreadsheets, right? Sometimes yeah. it can get a little tricky. And mm. one approach I've started taking is, or I, I took in the past was uh, to create the template itself as an Excel file uh -huh. and then and then read that in and use that as uh, as a template to match against. Mm. And mm. so I was thinking of this in the same way is you describe the template itself in Excel, right? Yeah. And Ooh, that becomes, okay. yeah, right. it becomes a very visual uh, yeah. representation then, right? Right, and, right, right. And, and uh, that makes it, I, I think, a lot easier to and, and especially for end users, right? And if you do this as a standalone library, as you know, you can run run it from the command line or or build it into an application, right? Your your uh, you have your import document documents to process, and then uh, here uh, create a uh, a spreadsheet that yeah. uh, create a sheet which represents what this template looks like. Right. Feed them right. both in, and while I how do you get the? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Do you have like a working example of that? Um, so this Can is some work I, I did for a customer, a client, yeah. uh, not for not for unstructured, but I did for structured. Yeah. Uh, and this was to comp to this was a where I was converting some uh, d data in the Excel spreadsheets into RDF, semantic mm -hmm. web um, formats. So. Uh, so I, I can actually, instead of you dealing with spreadsheets, I exported them as CSV files because they were right. it was a lot easier to deal with those, right? Yeah. And then, um, and then I was able to, uh, you know, parse them both yeah. and use the my uh, my template to do all the transforms yeah. rather than write everything right. in Clojure. Right. So it kind of gets yeah. becomes everything. It becomes very declarative then. Right. Right. But I would imagine it'd be a bit harder if it's unstructured, right? Yes. Like this, yes. this bridge to CSV basically doesn't exist. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it will be an order of magnitude more difficult <laughs> with semi-structured uh, right. formats, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Right. 
So, so, so Anthony have done this in the past as well. Mm. Um, and I think the hard part is not the computer part, it's the, the human process part. So mm. what I found is if the spreadsheets were produced programmatically by something else, then it was not difficult to do, right? Because you could rely on things. But my experience with Excel output has been that clients will add, want to add one more row and they'll do it manually, or they will add one more set of unstructured fields between two of those of the pre-existing ones. And so that's, that's I mean, that's mm -hmm. a problem with Excel. Excel is really flexible, but, but then there's a, there are no guardrails for end users and processes that rely on spreadsheets have this problem, all of them. So it's, uh, it's, I think it's a really hard problem from a business perspective, let alone from a computing perspective. So one, one thing, one interesting thing that I found and I actually like this is using numbers, uh, which is the Apple product, right? Yeah. And um, so like kind of like the spreadsheet that you showed uh, Anthony, which yeah. you had that header section, and then you had a tape, you had a, a table, uh, you know, the, the middle section with maybe a middle part with like, you know, one section, or maybe multiple, right? Uh -huh. And then you have the lower ones, lower mm. of, uh, foot, and you had two subsections within the footer, right? Yeah. So in, X, in Excel, it is treated as one sheet. Whereas in numbers you can represent them as tables within a sheet each each mm. one gets its unique table id right the, because it's at the end of the day it's a composition right you're composing a set of tables in a single sheet okay i see right? and in in fact in fxl um you you represent them as separate you are representing them as separate functions right or right. capturing them as right. separate components that you yeah. assemble together Right? right. So numbers does that in a, you know, treats them as separate tables with its own ID, table ID and all. So when you export it to CSV, you get yeah. the export as a directory yeah. uh, com comprised of each of those tables separately. Yeah. Right. So that's right. one way I've been able to actually uh, access and process each table individually. Yeah. So a, a semi-structured form now becomes a directory of csv files yeah but uh, hang on like i actually like i wonder if we can do something similar in excel like can we attach like metadata right to every mm -hmm. cell and then we, we can just tell like this thing belongs to this component and then when you read it back it's just sort of like filtering back and then and then, then you have your components back mm -hmm. and it could be yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't know Apache POI inside out, but that, that could be possible. And that would be analogous to like having the, the, the separate tables and numbers. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, so in a very so, simple way to do that might be just to highlight it in a different color. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, then, and then work off the color, use a color as a uh, <laughs> color to partition the data. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, like that uh, gets that gets a little <laughs> messy. <yeah. laughs> but yeah, but you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, I mean, I mean, like uh, like the, there's a recent issue, right, on sort of uh, hex uh, hex colors, right? So it, it doesn't have to look ugly as well. But yeah, I mean, it's a hack, right? Like if we can attach like metadata, that that would be great. So you generate it. Uh, yeah, so, so you generate it from closure uh, with the metadata attached and you give it to the client or to the consumer, they'll fill data in, but then you're only gonna read stuff out of uh, things that have metadata. Mm. And then you'll have your components preserved. So that might be a nice way to do it. Yeah, interesting. I'm, I'm wondering if anybody knows about uh, existing public examples of spreadsheets which are non-trivial to pass and process. 
that could be useful as, a, as an example that can be shared uh, for fixed practice. I'm not sure. Somehow open data nowadays is shared in other formats, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I mean, it would be simple enough to do, uh, you know, if it's like a structured one, it would be fairly trivial, right? You can, you can load anything, any CSV file into an Excel spreadsheet and save it as an Excel file. That's easy. Um, it's the semi-structured one that gets, you know, you, yeah. You, have, you can, it's, it shouldn't be too difficult to create some. What, what, one missing thing, I think, uh, Daniel, that, that, that's, that's currently not implemented is, is like charts, I think. Uh, sort of, if you can sort of, okay, you've got your stuff, but then I, I want to have a nice bar chart next to it as well. Because yeah. uh, then you'll have like a spreadsheet dashboard. <laughs> like, uh, and, and you could just generate that whatever frequency you like and that that's that can be your dashboard basically there's a hack for that anthony which is mm -hmm. to use xlts you can use excel oh. templates and so what you do is you create an excel template and you populate certain cells uh -huh. and then when the spreadsheet opens in excel it auto generates any graphical object that uses that range that's right. the name they give to the matrix in Excel. Right. So, so there's a really easy hack to do that. Hmm. So, so, yeah, so someone would make the Excel template by, uh, on, on Excel, right? Uh, right, not, yeah, not so what you do is you create, yeah. you create a file called, you create an XLT file. Hmm. And then you can use it to generate Excel spreadsheets uh, that have the graphical objects embedded and refer in fact, anything that has formulas. So what I did in the past, it created Excel templates and I populated a tab with a CSV file. And then the formatted part got the data from the uh, Excel, from the other tab. And you have a VBA program run and do the updating of the data from one tab to the other and that creates that allows you to create a, a dashboard like you were saying right, right so it's yeah. a combination you use fact you would use fexel to populate the data tab and then you would use excel and its capabilities to automatically build the dashboard hmm. right i i, I it, it's something that i i think I, i'd like to look into hmm. but, but, but is there like um, native support for, for, for charts and Apache POI? I, like I, I haven't looked. No, no, no. So this runs in Excel. This is an, okay. you, you know, what yeah. you're doing is you're leveraging yeah. Excel's capabilities. But um, I suppose what, what I'm saying is that like, if you can do it in Apache POI, I wonder if uh, that's. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. That might be better for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. So, so you can generate everything programmatically. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not super against this idea of like, I, I don't know, creating your template, creating like some, some sort of, a, you know, starting point uh, in, in Excel and then sort of having it populated programmatically. Uh, yeah. I think, so the, the problem is that you are then locked in and every spreadsheet requires its own ad hoc approach, right? Mm, right. You know, because Google Sheets yeah. is going to do it differently, and then Numbers yeah. is going to do it differently, right? So yeah. if we could do it through POI, anything that we can do that is platform independent, obviously, is yeah. that much better. Yeah. Hmm. But, but yeah, uh, Daniel, uh, uh, if we can make a spreadsheet dashboard, I think that that can be useful so for, for people. Mm. Uh, can I ask a general question about this space of spreadsheets? Uh, um, because there are all the, all the experts are here. Uh, so um, if I understand correctly, there are different desktop applications for right. spreadsheets like Excel and uh, LibreOffice and yeah. numbers and all that. And there are also some web 
applications for spreadsheets. Yeah. And there are a few open data formats that most of these know to read and write, like SLX, SL, oh, X, 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 X. I, I mix the letters, sorry. <laughs> so uh, that is one and ODT is another. So are the, there are the open formats and there are libraries like Apache POI that typically know to work with all the, the all of these because they actually work with the open format, right? Mm. And, and some parts are actually specific to certain apps. So what are these parts which are not general actually, which cannot be shared through the data format? Like for example, charts, are they standardized or are they specific or partially so? I know that if I, export uh, a, a, a sheets, Google Sheets, and the, sometimes the, 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 the charts do not work on Excel. So I, so I don't know if the, the translation there is, is perfect, but uh, that's the extent to my knowledge on, on, on that, as it is. I, I, yeah, I don't know if Andres has, 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 has work, worked on this before. No, it's actually a really hard question, uh, and I haven't done it recently. When I did it, um, an Excel format wasn't open, and so that really wasn't an option. You could hack it, but you, you know, clients don't want you to do that, so um, so we didn't. Uh, I, I know that right now the formats are all XML based, but Excel is a proprietary one, and. Um, I think people have, if you look at the POI documentation, they have reverse engineered a lot of the stuff, right? Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, so I mean, I think I need to look at POI and see what support there is for charting at all, right? I, yeah, I'm not aware of any at this point. I'm, I'm seeing this, there's this a class called XSSF chart, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, uh, yeah who, I don't know how flexible that is, I suppose. Let's go to look into it. Mm. Great. Uh, Anthony, can I ask what, sure. would, what would help you in your development? Uh, if you wish to tell uh, also the people listening to the recording how they could uh, contribute, if it makes sense. Yeah, and any sorts of contributions are, are great, uh, features, issues. Uh, but uh, one thing that, uh, that, that that's, that's quite hard uh, for me to do is sort of like, I, I view a lot of these in a, in a biased lens, right? Like I'm, I'm focusing on my particular use case. So sort of, uh, yeah. Uh, I care a lot about ergonomics. So uh, if, if they're like, use cases where like, you know, this thing doesn't really work. Uh, yeah, uh, basically dog fooding, right? Like just, just using it and then finding the what's and then, uh, yeah, uh, try, try to solve them. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's that, I suppose. And, you know, uh, for me, it's like, uh, I, I really enjoy that, that people are using it and, and I, I, you know, we get to help people uh, and, and that's, that's the extent to that really, that, that it doesn't have to, to be anything more than that, uh, at least for, for our purposes. Mm. Great, uh, any other questions? Um, Daniel, I just wanted to point out that there are lots of features that aren't uh, documented, and I'm, it's not a criticism, Anthony. I know there's a lot of ground to cover, yeah. but for instance, uh, the That's current true. implementation does support multiple tabs. All you have to do is specify the sheet name for each cell, and then in, it knows where to put it. So it's a really straightforward. So if you wanted to write a multi-sheet spreadsheet, all you have to do is write a, a function um, that can then map all the cells and tell them where to live. So they, it's really a nice implementation. 
just look at the code. I mean, the code is so clean. You can just, uh, um, you can learn, if you look at the cell, uh, um, this spec, you can learn a lot about how things work. Yeah, th thank you, Andres. Like, yeah, I suppose uh, documentation is something that, that uh, yeah, uh, it's, 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 it's lacking. Yeah, and um, yeah, so maybe it makes sense, um, Anthony, if, if uh, you think so, uh, to talk a bit about your hopes for the future in this development. What are the difficult open questions that you hope that one day uh, could be dreamed of? And also maybe it is an opportunity to talk about uh, uh, other projects uh, you're interested in, like your other library, Guinea, or any other thing that you uh, have um, like hopes for and want to share. Yeah. So, so I, I think um, Clojure has like a potential, right? Like uh, to, to be uh, this fast prototyping language uh, to, to replace Python in the space of you know, okay, I've got some data to do, uh, I've got some data to process, and I, I just need to do this, these simple operations and get some insights, right? Because uh, at least for me now, like, uh, I, I, you know, for some cases, I still reach to Python, even though, like, you know, I, I always have Guinea in, in, in mind, right? Uh, and, 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 and Fixel as well. Uh, but yeah, I, I, my, my hope is that uh, eventually it'll be like, yeah, there's a no brainer, uh, like let's, let's just go straight to closure. A, a few things that, 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 that's annoying in closure. I think uh, startup time is, is annoying. GNI startup time is, is annoying because uh, Spark context has to be initialized. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so I, you know, I'm putting a lot of hopes and, 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 and Babashka, this, this, this native images, uh, like hopefully that, that, that'll go somewhere, right? Uh, yeah. Um, that, that, so that, that's, that's, the, the, that's the dream. Uh, uh, with respect to other projects that I'm working on, uh, nowadays I do, uh, yeah, I, I don't, unfortunately I don't use Clojure that much. Uh, I'm, I'm involved in a machine learning project now, so that, that's like very much, uh, Python heavy, right? Uh, um, but uh, we do optimization a lot. Um, and previously that was done in Python as well, but I think there's, there's a nice, again, data oriented way of uh, representing constrained optimizations. Uh, and there's uh, nice libraries, Java libraries around like OR tools and Opta Planner that I think we can wrap and, and, and have this language of constraint optimization. Uh, uh, like we deal a lot with like large scale constraint optimizations. And I'm talking about like tens of thousands of constraints, right? Um, yeah, so that, that, that's something uh, in my so mind. So you're I actually might, uh, writing them in Java interop nowadays? No, uh, Python. Oh. Python. Uh, mm -hmm. So that there's, yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, I think uh, it, it'll happen uh, one day. Uh, yeah, so j just need to, to do the work, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, uh, um, my feeling is that we're getting there in the sense of soon, maybe during this year, it, it will make sense to say that closure is ready to be used as a, a widely used tool that mm -hmm. anyone can pick and use for processing data and exploring data. And, and we are now at this phase of asking ourselves, what is missing? Asking mm -hmm. a lot and, and, and as much as we are asking, there are actually a few things that need, need mm -hmm. some better care but people are looking into them and yeah. and so it feels like converging so maybe uh, does it make sense to ask it uh, uh, to ask everybody here if uh, about their wishes and about how they see the story of closure becoming like a, a very uh, friendly and uh, ergonomic tool that anybody can pick yeah 
Yeah, and, and we will be asking that a lot in the coming weeks and uh, maybe a couple of months because the, I think it is becoming a central question uh, for us. So there will be more opportunities to discuss that. Um, any comments? So, so Daniel? Yeah. To answer that question that you just asked, um, I'm new to the group, so maybe other people have spoken before. Um, so I, I, I use Python. I began with Lisp. There was something called X Lisp Stat in the 90s. Um, but when I went to work, uh, people laughed at my 19, 1988 copyright. And I looked for something else. I found Python. Uh, Python does a really good job in, in terms of ergonomics. And for its time, it was heads and above the best, right? Um, I moved away from Python for two reasons. So one of them was performance. It gets challenging in some contexts. And the second was mutability. Um, I was doing a project for a large client and had a bug that took me several days to find because I was inadvertently mutating a dictionary. Um, and so I, I literally looked for computer languages immutable and Clojure came right up. I think the main challenge is that the closure is easy to get started with. Um, I think it's really hard to get good at it. Um, it's it's subtle, you know. So so, and Anthony, please bear with me. The work you've done, I find really interesting because it's taught me a lot of how to think in a closure-like fashion, um, how to decompose the problem. And I think that's something that I think maybe I might start thinking to maybe try and write something about because I think that is the that is the hardest part to move from a declarative object based approach to something that is data oriented um, and stream oriented. Right. Um, it's not, you know, once you make the switch, then it's natural and you think, oh, why didn't I think like this before? But I think it's quite hard to make the transition. And I think that is an obstacle for the, and I see it, I'll say it, I think for the transition from Python to Clojure, because Python is where data science has been playing for quite a while. A lot of people that I know in the space are frustrated because of performance issues. For instance, in the particular case of Geni, PySpark has the problem that you have to serialize your objects back and forth between Python and Java. Um, I do have a question. Does any, but has anybody really played with the library that allows uh, the use of NumPy within Clojure? Is this problem present with that library or can you operate directly on the, on the structures? Directly. So that, that is fantastic. Yes. Yeah, I, th I think you can count on Chris to, to, to get that one uh, right. Uh, yeah, I think the Python CLG is, 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 is the real deal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, oh, one thing I'd also like to add, uh, Daniel, um, I think in, in Sami's talk about, about uh, the closure data ecosystem, he, he did mention one thing, right? Maybe not mentioned, but demonstrated one thing that, that actually marketing matters. Like, uh, like he was showing like uh, a beginner maybe, uh, someone who, who's, who's new to closure and then looking through the cyclosure website and, and thinking that it's rather, uh, looks rather old fashioned. Uh, yeah, so maybe it's like, uh, yeah, that, that, that part of it we, we need to work on as well uh, to, to get that. But yeah, I, I don't have a solution to that, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, by the way, um, yeah, uh, our friend uh, John uh, practically uh, has been working on creating a new beautiful website that tells the story of uh, closure for data science and data exploration. It is still under construction. And yeah, it, probably that is one of the problems. But what else? So uh, Andres, I think it was fascinating to, to hear your view. 
and you know uh, comparing closure to uh, the ergonomics of python and i'm wondering what the gap is or except for that conceptual gap that you were telling about what else there is that could be different or couldn't be different maybe that is like an obstacle i think the libraries right so there's so many libraries for um, machine learning and um, analytics that are running on the Python platform. Um, I mean, the journey that I've seen a lot of people take is a lot of Python on the desktop. Then they move to clusters with PySpark. Then people run into performance issues, and then they translate the PySpark programs into either Java Spark or Scala Spark, right? So I think the gap that I see for us is um, libraries for both specific use cases that are very narrow. In fact, I think of the space as a collection of um, very domain specific libraries running on a platform, Pandas for the desktop or Spark for clusters. Right. And then there are things like the creation of graphical output, where Python has a half a dozen really mature and beautiful libraries. And I'm aware of a few libraries in the closure space, but by comparison, you know, we just don't have the documentation, we don't have the examples in, on GitHub, you know. So I think that's an area where um, I think we're moving to it. That's on the on the gap side. On the plus ledger, um, Python has been stuck on the notebook platform. And as everybody is aware, not notebooks are wonderful, but they're difficult, right? They have their issues. Um, I really am very impressed by the work the group has been doing to try to come up with a, with a different paradigm um, for in the REPL as a really rich interaction space. I think that's, if we can fulfill that dream, I think that that could be something that could propel the community forward, because that would be something that would pull people into the closure ecosystem. Uh, very much like uh, Shiny was able to do for R. Um, I think Anthony mentioned something about marketing. Uh, I would add the word sizzle, right? Um, you have a steak that sizzle that's more appetizing. I feel that 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 it's what R and Shiny have done together. So I think that's an area that if we can develop something more interesting, and I'm thinking here in terms of uh, the Rebel, Rebel, or Reveal, or the Note space. I know that you've been working on some of that. I think that's an area where I think we could we could bring more people to closure. Um, I think immutability makes thinking about data uh, better. And I think the story around Spark and Clojure has been difficult. There was a project, project called Flambeau that was usable, but it really wasn't, in my opinion, quite as seamless as what Jenny is. So I think of Jenny as a, as a piece, and I'm, I'm kind of wondering how we can make the Spark community more aware of it. Because I think, if you think of Spark and Scala as being, you know, I think Spark propelled Scala forward. I think that, that Jenny has the potential for really helping people come to the space because Jenny is the horizontal layer. Any data problem needs ETL. And I think Spark is really good for ETL, and Geni is a great way to express that ETL processing. So I, I think the story is quite optimistic, but we, A, we need graphic libraries, and B, we need more awareness of what's available, and I think the website will offer that. And the last thing I will say is that Clojure has a really good story for front-end development. So right now in the world of data science, if you work for a large corporate firm, you will have a back-end group doing analytics, Spark, and so on. 
And then you'll have front end people building dashboards and these people don't speak the same language. I think with Clojure offers the potential for unifying everything so that you actually have a truly integrated uh, development in terms of all the way vertical integration, all the way from data cleansing to analytics to front end presentation, right? Um, Faxel is kind of a sidebar for Excel representation, right? There might be other ways to represent data. You know, Rebel might be another way to do it. Um, and I think the potential exists in a way that I don't think is present even in the big gorilla, which is Python. I think Clojure has more potential, uh, which is why I'm investing time and energy. Uh, um, I came to Python in 1999 when it was not very popular. I gave a presentation to the largest drugstore chain in the US in 2000, suggesting they should try to move to Python to do all their analysis. And they all thought that was crazy. I feel this very same way about Clojure today. I think that in 10 years, uh, Clojure will be dominant. Um, and I'm hoping that that's actually true. Fingers crossed. That, that sounds very good. <laughs> yeah. Very enlightening. You know, I'm thinking about the uh, different uh, aspects we were mentioning here, like machine learning and data processing and data visualization. And I think in most of them, uh, the situation is typically better than we know in the sense that, uh, that uh, uh, Andres let, you know, earlier you were telling me, if you look at the code, you will see that the functionality is already there. And that is actually the situation with the current machine learning stack that is emerging and the data visualization stack and the data processing. And what has not happened with all of them yet is a beautiful API like Gunny has, which is actually a hard work, actually making uh, a collection of functions that live in harmony. And that is still missing, I think, in a few of the libraries. But it means that we could be like a few weeks or months away from something that is actually magnificent in, in any of these fields. And, and yeah, that is where we are. So it seems right. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts about that? Um, um, does anybody want to ask uh, Anthony about anything else or raise any uh, other topics? Hey, Anthony, there is a, or a general question. There was a project called Encanter before. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what's happening with it? I think it's, it's not no longer active. Mm. Um, like someone from Imperity uh, said, like, uh, like if you mention Encanter, that's like the 2010 uh, answer for mm -hmm. data analysis in Python. So and, and, and closures, excuse me. Uh, so yeah, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, I, I tried it. It's not as seamless. It's uh, it, like I loaded a data, uh, loaded a data frame with like many. Uh, missing values and it's just crashes. It's not uh, like, yeah, I think you, you need like a really nice engine for, for these data frame operations. So, yeah. So, so I, I don't, I, yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. I it's not, it's not in my range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I used it a few years back and it actually was pretty good back then, given the range of functionality it provided. Uh, it was pretty good. I, and I, you're right. Uh, I don't see that being actively developed. And uh, although they keep promising there's a version two coming out and uh, they're up to 1.9.3 or something, but I don't really see any active development going on. Right. So I don't, I don't know what's happening, but it, I was just curious. Yeah. That, that, that's definitely the, the first library I, I stumbled upon when I wanted to do uh, mm -hmm. the enclosure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
it was the basis for a lot of data science work previously. If you, if you go to their website, they have a quite detailed uh, uh, you know, blogs about, you know, uh, stories about uh, what you can do with Encanto. Right. Right. Hmm. Certainly, it was also an inspiration for the current stack that is now more active. And mm. I think I, if we look into the functionality of Encounter, then most of it is present in both the, the emer of the emerging data frame libraries, which are Guinea and tablecloth and behind mm -hmm. the scenes of the tablecloth, the tech data set uh, technology. I think both of them are covering in terms of functionality, a lot of what Encanta had. And yeah, and it would be great to think again, what the gaps are and how we should go about them, right? Um, so Daniel, since you mentioned tablecloth and Jenny in the same sentence, right? Are we, what, um, how do they compare and how do, is, are they complementary or do you see them as, uh, uh, you know, serving different purposes or what, what is the, what is the overlap and what is the differences? What are the differences? Uh, yeah, be, before we go about that, I think uh, Elena was going to say something maybe. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, it, it's kind of going back, and I wasn't sure if I should say it, but I was thinking about what Andres said about uh, immutability. And I'm looking at it from pedagogical standpoint. You know, I try to teach students right away, first immutable and then mutable. Um, so functional first, which makes it easier. But I think it would be interesting to include so when we're talking about sort of a list of things that people need to transition from say Python based framework to closure based, I think immutability needs to be something that we explicitly teach rather than sort of, oh, it just comes with the territory. And that's all I wanted to say. And it's also almost 9 a.m. here and I've been up since six and so my brain is not working very well, but I'm just trying to think of how to include that sort of in that checklist of where other things like libraries live and be explicit about it. And that's all. <laughs> mm. I, 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 I have a thought on that actually. Um, what what so, yeah, I'm, I'm almost afraid to say this, but uh, what, um, I thought what, what helped a lot uh, to sort of like really uh, get this immutability and then uh, and uh, just grokking it, right, is, is to understand Haskell's type system and sort of... Um, from pedagogical standpoint... <laughs> <laughs> I think if we want to say teach this approach to data science sophomores, yeah. Yeah. I don't think our way to that should be Haskell type system. Sure. I mean, I hear you, um, but I really think that it should be something where we know where people are coming from. I mean. Again, I think of, when I think of Java, I think of ML, right? But that's me. That's not how mm. I teach students. Mm. And I'm not sure what all needs to happen, but all I want to suggest is to kind of include that in the list of things that people need to be taught. And then, and again, it's not, I mean, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, in some sense, because I think there've been people who taught immutability and functional approach to uh, people who come from imperative, but at the same time, it is hard. 
it's harder for me to teach students who have had uh, a year of Python and teach them racket than students who are starting from the ground up because there is a lot of sort of inverting the way you think that needs to happen. And so I think having best practices, having tutorials, having something along those lines might be helpful. Um, Elena, mm -hmm. you are correct about Python. Around the year 2000, Python started becoming more Java-like and people started using setters and getters. Peter Norvig writes really interesting Python because it's not like that. It might be a good way to get people, get your students to, if they use Python, to go take a look at Peter Norvig and then um, use that approach. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, they haven't had years of experience, so they're fairly easy to unteach. So, I mean, their introductory students uh, takes about two weeks. I just tell them they're about two weeks behind. Uh, <laughs> and they, that's, yes. That's what Matthias Felison uh, thinks of, you know, students coming in with some programming background. But I think for people who have been doing Python for years, that might be an approach. And I know that people write also interesting Java and JavaScript, like everybody writes Lisp and, you know, or there are people who write Lisp in all kinds of languages. Yeah, um, Norvig is interesting, really. It's, you know, I, I learned a lot about Python from Norvig because it, he really leverages the, the language in a way that, that is intellectually stimulating. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I have, I, I have seen, I think, something of his at the conference or a talk at some point, but maybe that's maybe that is a place to look. His, his web page is a bunch of Python programs, yeah. Python notebooks, where he does yeah. interesting things. Yeah. Are you talking about PyTudes? He has a he has a repository called PyTudes. That's it's a bunch of notebooks. So yes. Okay. Yes, it's a really interesting way of thinking about Python because he does it. He's He's more procedural. I mean, you, you know, so he doesn't decompose things into objects right away. You, you know, I know I'm preaching to the choir. I think he's thinking still in terms of data as opposed to, to objects. And so he, they, Python accent that he has, I think is, is really productive. Hmm. Uh, Anthony, I have one more question for you about how, you know, the user base for, for Genie, do you know how, mm -hmm. you know, do you know who's using it or any, or can you share some information on that? Yeah. I, I, I do not. I, 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 um, I get occasional questions on Slack or, or Zulip uh, and, and the occasional issues, but uh, this is, uh, I'll, I'll tie it back to Sivaram's question about a Genie and tablecloth, right? But by and large, Everyone who's using Gani has had some experience with Spark. They, they come from Spark, they, they're happy with Spark. They're, they also like Clojure and uh, they, uh, they fight. So like very similar background as me, basically. Uh, so I, I want to have Spark, but uh, just a, ni a nicer medium language, right? Um, yeah, so uh, that, that's the, the situation, but uh, I know that uh, the, the study group possibly will be doing Guinea uh, sometime uh, in the future. So that'll be an interesting experiment to see someone who's, uh, who hasn't had like a spark background and try to, 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 to learn the, the library. So I, I imagine there'll be some, some uh, challenges uh, there because there's a lot of spark uh, baggage uh, there, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's sort of circling back, right? Like what's, what's the relationship with Guinea and tablecloth, right? For me, like I've got, I've kind of sort of like uh, talked about this on, on Zulip, but uh, it's, it's kind of a half-baked thing, right? But in Python, you have pandas and PySpark, right? And they sort of like coexist and, and they, they happily coexist. Uh, so Spark is, is a big monster in its own right. Right. Uh, I think you can sort of attract like people, uh, customers there. Uh, and it could be that uh, uh, tablecloth is, 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 is like the pandas uh, equivalent, 
right? And 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 to 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 use the as the closures equivalent to Python, uh, and and PySpark and, and and Guinea. So it, it doesn't. Uh, so when when people come in uh, for the first time, you'll sort of usher them to a tablecloth. But then once they think about clusters, performance. Uh, uh, scaling it up, uh, or just using all their cores, maybe uh, uh, then it's uh, you, you can you can start thinking about about Guinea. Uh, but yeah, I mean that that's just a, a, sh a short thought on that. I, I don't know, Andres, if you have any, uh, if you. Well, I, so you write about the baggage, right? One has to know some concepts, um, but the documentation you have is really good. So I was using originally Pandas for my problem, but then I was running, I was having some performance problems on my laptop. So then I used Genie on the same equipment and the performance is actually way better. Yeah. So I'm using it as Pandas. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, you know I, I work for a liquor store chain and my job really isn't, isn't doing this. I do other things, but uh, I ended up doing this kind of for fun. Mm. And, uh, Pandas was not as ergonomic as Guinea by a, by a long shot. I mean, I'm more productive and much quicker in my running of reports and things. I, I do a lot of ad hoc stuff now on the fly with, you know, my bosses looking over my shoulder. I might not do that with Pandas. Mm. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Pandas has a, has a funky API yeah, and, and, and performance can sometimes be quite unpredictable. I think it's a great story. I would love to for you to go to conferences and open this up. I think, uh, I mean, I don't know if, um, uh, I mean, I don't know when the conference will start again, you know, but I'm thinking of Hadoop Boral or their equivalents. I think that this would be really interesting. Right, as in going outside of the closure world and then- Exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, I think there's a really strong story to tell because, you, you know, the way they sold Scala was by comparing Java, the Java program versus the Scala program. And if you compare um, Scala Spark or Python Spark to any programs, I mean, particularly if you have the story with Fexel and other things, I think that could be a really strong suit to, you know, a really strong selling idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, uh, I think yeah, it should definitely do that. Mm. Th th thank you for, uh, for the suggestion. But uh, yeah, I think I should do that. Uh, we are now uh, at the end of the two hours officially. Uh, if anybody wishes to stay, then I'm happy to uh, stay and discuss things, but maybe a few of us need to leave. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for this. Okay. And I'm so happy not only about the talk, but uh, about that other discussion that we mm. just had now. And, uh, you know, this uh, question of how we could uh, bring up immutability as a central notion in the beginning of any experience. Uh, that that was really enlightening to me to to try to think about it, and and we need to make that part of the practice somehow. And hopefully, we can make another meeting just about that, um, uh, if it makes sense. Uh, and um, yeah, any other uh, final comments before we end uh, the official part? Oh, this was fantastic. Thank you, Anthony, for describing uh, FXL you. and uh, Daniel for organizing this as usual. And uh, great questions, right? Probably good to have a great audience. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. That was great. You, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.